Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tea Talks with Ji Ling, where we share tea, conversations, and camaraderie with visionary herbalists rippling positive change into their communities by connecting people, plants, and place. I'm Ji Ling, your host, acupuncturist, herbalist, and yoga teacher on Herbal Radio, presented by Mountain Rose Herbs. Please make yourself comfortable, pour a cup of your favorite tea, and welcome to today's Tea Talk with Giuseppe Spadafora. Welcome, Giuseppe. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeeling. <laughs> yeah. So for everyone, Giuseppe Spadafora traveled the U.S. for over a decade, offering free tea to friends and strangers alike from Edna New Edna. Lou, the free tea bus, because sharing is the primary way that humans create, maintain, and deepen bonds. This project inspired people to cultivate community through the gift. And a little intro from myself, too. I met Giuseppe many years ago, if you can remember, at the Traditions in Western Herbalism Conference in New Mexico, which is now known as I don't even know what the new name for the conference is. It the name of the conference keeps changing. <laughs> it was Herb Folk that year. Yeah. Oh, that year it was Herb Folk. Herb Folk, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I remember I was wandering through the conference. I didn't know anybody else there just yet and was feeling uh, a little bit of trepidation and a little bit of excitement in a new place. And I come across this really beautiful bus decked out with lights and music and people gathered around and there's a very welcoming welcome sign so I kind of sneak, sneak my way over and there's Giuseppe with Ali who's now your wife <laughs> with with you at the bus welcoming everybody and serving fresh tea with really warm um, warm camaraderie a real feeling of generosity permeating the space and that's how we got to know each other the first time. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's rather exciting to invite people into a space, especially when people are looking for connection or looking for a place to be or looking for you know all the things that our society is oftentimes really bad at uh, obviously herbalism gatherings are, are tend to be pretty community oriented and stuff like that but um that's really what the tea bus is about is providing that space for people to connect over a warm cup of tea you know i always like to say that free tea parties happen millions of times all all over the world every day whether you know go anywhere in asia or north africa or you know afternoon tea in england or yerba mate in south america these are all traditions of sharing free tea as a way to connect with other people. Yeah. So how did you get started with the Edna Lu free tea bus project? And what has the trajectory of that adventure been like? And where is Edna Lu now? And where are you now? Yeah, those are all great <laughs> questions. Um, I So I traveled around in Edna Lu for about 11 years. But before that, I was in a pickup truck for two years serving tea on and off as I traveled. But basically, um, I found myself out of, fresh out of college um, in Los Angeles, uh, working full time as a video editor. And, and in order to basically get paid nothing, which is what you often do to get your foot in the door, um, I was living in my pickup truck. So not paying rent so that I could afford to to give my labor away. Um, but I was working 50 or 60, sometimes 70 hours a week. And I had no friends, no community. I basically sat in front of a computer screen all day long, um, editing a documentary. And so I found it, it was a little distressing. You know, I, I came from a college environment where, you know, you see the same people repetitively and and that's kind of one of the ways that we make friends is seeing the same people over and over again, randomly. And, uh, and being in Los Angeles, a big city, all my interactions when I went out and about in the city were, they all revolved around profit maximization. So I would go to the store and I would try to get as much food as I could for my dollars and the cashier in the store trying to get as much dollars as they can for the food. <laughs> and same thing, I, I go to the bar because I was you know, 21, 22 at that time. And and uh, my interactions were, you know, young women come up to me and, hey, you want to buy me a drink? Can you buy me a drink? And then they walk away. And so I just was kind of fed up with 
some of those kinds of interactions. So randomly one day I just um, went down to Hollywood Boulevard after work because I worked pretty close to, to there. And Hollywood Boulevard is really interesting because you have just people from all walks of life, tourists from all over the world, people from all over Los Angeles, um, and you know every age range, every socioeconomic status, every color. It's a pretty varied uh, uh, group of people out there on Hollywood Boulevard. So I just started opening up the tailgate of my pickup truck and put out a couple camp chairs and I would cook dinner. People wandering by would ask me what I was doing. What is this? Why are you here? What is that? You know, what is this about? I'm like, oh, I'm just cooking dinner on my tailgate. This is my kitchen. Welcome. Would you care to join me? And inevitably, passersby would stop and and eat dinner with me. And it was it was really sweet. And I just started meeting all kinds of strangers. And then after dinner, to keep those interactions going, I would just put the kettle on for hours and make tea because it was this really simple, easy thing to do that was low cost. And, um, and what I found was, you know, I could buy, I could go buy a hundred bags of Lipton and tea at the store for the same price. I could buy a girl a drink at the bar. And <laughs> all of a sudden I had, was having, I could have a hundred genuine human interactions and, um, and this loneliness that I've been experiencing and that actually like something like 40% of a American adults experience chronic loneliness um, this loneliness I had been experiencing was cured by tea. Um, and it was so magical because, you know, all kinds of amazing synchronicities and things were coming together where, you know, one time one guy, this guy came by and he's like, oh, I've got enough uh, ground beef to make eight burgers. Let's fry them up. And I was like, okay, let's fry up the burgers. And then, you know, someone came by 10 minutes later and was like, hey, do you guys, I've got these eight buns. Do you want these eight buns? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so it just turned, it kind of turned into this, it was almost like a potluck. But, you know, a lot of people would come and bring things. And sometimes it was just stories or musical instruments or, um, but, but pretty soon people were like, hey, do you want to be the tea man? Or, hey, hey, it's the tea man. Hey, it's the tea guy. And I was like, oh man, I don't even know if I like tea, but I guess I'll be the tea guy. <laughs> and, and that's really what it comes down to for me is that tea became that vehicle for getting my basic needs met. You know, we're taught in our society that when you give something away for free, you no longer have it and therefore you're losing out. Um, but in reality, what I found is that when you share with people, you're actually creating something that's oftentimes more valuable than the physical object you're sharing, which is, you know, like a bond. Mm. Um, and so those early days on Hollywood Boulevard really just set the set the the pace for me and in, in as I traveled because I, I was there for about three months and then um, just took the free tea thing on the road about two years later I bought Edna Lou the tea bus well she was just an empty yellow school bus when I bought her and and hit the road first thing where did your journey take you so I traveled primarily the West Coast for many, many years. And then uh, in around 2013, I started what I called the North American free tea tour. And that was really that point where I felt like the bus was complete. You know, I built all these systems. The bus runs on recycled vegetable oil and has solar power and all the wood inside is salvaged wood and it's all woodworked and you know, solar fridge and wood stove for heat, all these things that uh, these systems and were finally complete around 2013. And so I, I headed off on this North American tour and that took me all down the West Coast to, through the Southwest. I spent much time in Texas, a little bit through the Midwest, up to the Northeast. Wow. Um, I spent a bunch of time in the Northeast, down all the way a bunch of time in mid-Atlantic, North Carolina, West Virginia, Georgia, all through the deep south, a bunch of time in Arkansas, Colorado. Um, so a lot of places. I did spend a lot of time in the Midwest or upper Midwest, but uh, each time I crossed the country, it took me about, so between like nine and 15 months. So about a year, it takes me to drive across the country. <laughs> That's so 
amazing. What a nice relaxed journey and sharing tea and meeting friends. And I imagine some stops you plan in advance and some stops you just stop and set up a tea station. Definitely. Oh, (laughs) I need to plug in my computer. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Um, I remember I was teaching uh, an herb class series in Connecticut and it just so happened that at that time you and Ali were, and Edna Lou, of course, were up in the Northeast and you asked me perhaps a week before coming down, like, Hey, are you still in Connecticut? Can we come visit? (laughs) And it just so happened. Do you remember? It just so happened that that was the night that I was teaching my class about tea and we were having a big barn dance happening (laughs) that was so much fun that was so much fun yeah yeah so Giuseppe came in to speak at my tea class which was just perfect for Giuseppe to come in and speak with my students and then afterwards um, you all set up Edna Lou right outside of the huge old barn and we just had a steady stream of people coming in and out of the bus so much fun and that's, and that's what it's about. You know, so much of the journey is finding the right places to be. And, and when you give in to the journey, oftentimes that's when the magic happens. You know, that's when the synchronicities happen. That's when, um, you know, it just happened that we were coming through at that right time in the right place. And it was beautiful and it was magical. And, and, I, and that was like a very memorable um, I think we were there for a couple of days. I think it was super memorable because of all the magic that um, was happened. And I think that's one of the things that the free tea bus brings places is magic. It's, it's taking people out of the ordinary, although that barn dance was nothing. It was far from ordinary <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Um, but, and that whole place. So yeah, a lot of it's just about bringing magic and having having that magic in our lives on a regular basis. And sometimes it's really easy for us to get kind of caught in our little daily, daily activities and daily life. And, and um, so, yeah. yeah. So taking us to now, as during the time of this recording, this is September, 2021, the pandemic is picking up its second or third win with the yeah. Delta variant. Yeah. And with this element of magic and interweaving magic into our ordinary lives, how does that look during times such as these? That's a really good question and one that I have been struggling with myself. And I wish I had perfect and good answers for that. Um, yeah, magic. Got to keep the magic alive. And it's it's much harder when we can't sit face to face and when we can, um, you know, I, I have not been sharing free tea um, with strangers during the pandemic. And um, and that's a, as a that's been a really tough thing for me because so much of my life revolved around having magical experiences with people. Um, and for me, uh, I think a lot of it was just accepting the fact that the magic is on pause a little bit during these times. And then um, on another token, I don't know, figuring out ways that we can have magic, not indoors with people. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I have, I, and, and, and part of the journey for me, honestly, has been, you know, I've been practicing indiscriminate sharing with tens of thousands of people for a decade or more. And the, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was that you know, throughout most of human history, that the people that we shared with were those who were closest to us and the people we really want to be maintaining and creating and deepening bonds with. And so for me, the pandemic has been a really great moment to bring a lot of that sharing and that magic into the lives of the people that are closest to me. Mm-hmm. And the people like Allie and I have been staying at my mom's place up on San Juan Island in Washington. And we happened to be there when the pandemic hit and it just, we created our own little zone and we just started building and creating gardens and, um, you know, doing little self-sufficiency projects and homesteading projects and raising chickens and, and really focusing on, yeah, creating magic in everyday, what everyday life with just those immediate people around you, maybe people that are in your germ circle or, or people that you're able to um, share some moments with outside. I have invited a few people over that I um, have become friends with or whatever to sit outside of Edna and enjoy some tea and 
um, but it has definitely toned down quite a bit. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting to go from all these years of travel for you to come into this more settled place and building and raising chickens and having gardens and all of these things of which you speak. And that that's another journey and a different kind of magic, a more settled kind yeah. of magic and bringing these circles, which you've expanded so wide yeah. uh, in a little bit tighter and yeah. closer to home. So where Where's Edna Lou now? So Edna Lou is parked up on San Juan Island. Um, just basically, uh, Allie and I at, currently live in an apartment above my mom's garage. And Edna Lou's parked right outside. And she is kind of a little guest house, office, occasional tea house, you know, retreat. Um, just as kind of a multifunctional space right now. Um, and... It's this weird thing, you know, when you live full time in a bus, it makes so much sense to do all the maintenance and to keep it registered and do the insurance and all the stuff. And, uh, but when it's not full time, it's, um, it makes less sense. And I kind of built Edna to be once, once she retired, which may or may not be now, I don't know if that's the case or not, um, to be a cabin and to be a, a place that a space that can be parked and be self-contained and functional you know running water and electricity and you know bed and wood stove and all the things you need in the cabin and uh, that's kind of what she is right now and I'm, I'm kind of on the fence as to whether or not she will make grand journeys again or not um, but the longer I wait the more maintenance it is to and, and upkeep to to keep her moving and yeah yeah so besides the Edna Lou project, I know that you've been starting other projects as well, such as uh, I remember back when you were visiting Connecticut, you were dreaming about this Tinkerman bus. And I think that's a thing now for you, right? Yeah, well, you know, it, through the process of building the free tea bus and traveling around the country and working in lots of different places and, and finding really amazing work doing kind of alternative things, building with salvage materials, doing natural building, uh, building all kinds of like systems like off-grid solar systems and I, I'm just super geeky about tools and hardware and all of that stuff and salvage materials. So I end up, um, I end up getting hired to do all kinds of really fun projects, um, that are sustainability related, but a lot of the time, I mean, even in my travels, I just do things to help people. Um, and so that oftentimes looks like helping people people build things or fix things on their house or homestead or farm or wherever I end up. And right now I'm kind of on this tour. I've done a few of these. I ended up getting a pickup truck, which is so weird to not have Edna traveling with me, but I'm on a trip right now. I'm in Eureka, California, and I've just been stopping in places and helping people out. Um, and, and a lot of it are people that, I'm, that are close to me. Um, you know, I, I stopped in Portland to help a friend do a bunch of work, a uh, shop space that I have used a ton, uh, brought my, my bus into to work on my bus. And I just helped my buddy get everything ready for drywall, doing a bunch of electrical and framing and stuff like that. And, uh, here in Eureka, I just was helping a friend of mine who is starting a mobile, like animal show. He's got reptiles and birds and insects. And we, and he's built this really cool wagon trailer thing all all salvage wood. And we just put 1600 Watts of solar on the roof. And that's kind of was my project was getting all the solar on there for him to take this traveling animal show on the road to bring to schools and events and parks. And so I've just kind of fallen into being the fix it, build it guy with its revolves around sustainability and salvage materials and, and stuff like that. And I hope to do, I am to have been daydreaming of basically refining it as a project similar to the free tea bus where I, I do go on tours and trips and help people, friends and strangers alike do fun projects like that. This relationship-based economies aspect is a huge part of your work, and it yeah. was a huge part of Edna Lou, and it sounds like it continues to be, to be a huge part of your yeah. dream as you continue moving forward with what sounds like your next bus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Will you tell us a little bit more about how relationship-based economies work? Yeah. So... 
It's relationship-based economy. Some people call it gift economy or traditional human economy. And there's different variations depending on where you are in the world and, and what culture you're in. And, but primarily indigenous peoples around the world, you know, as, as history, we have this kind of myth in our society that before money, there was barter because, you know, our current economic system tells us that selfishness and or self-interest is the primary human motivator and therefore before money we were also trying to maximize profit and therefore we must have been trying to get something out of every interaction and so barter was what happened before money that's what adam smith tells us the father of modern day economics but what we find is that we've never as history writing people and anthropologists and people have traveled around the world and studied indigenous cultures is we've never found an indigenous culture that uses barter as the primary form of exchange. Instead, what we find is that sharing and gifting is the primary form of exchange. And, and sure, when two communities or two tribes meet, there is barter because there's sharing is all about building bonds and connection. And with outsiders and different groups, you know, one for one interactions is a little more standard because you're not necessarily trying to build intimacy. And may, maybe there's some, there's still some sharing happening. Um, but relationship-based economy, I kind of, my take on it, and it's very broad, and I don't mean to place this on any culture that does it a little bit differently or whatever. And there's, there's always, you know, individual cultures that do things. Obviously, every culture has its own guidelines and mores and norms and stuff like that. But in, in general, I view relationship-based economy as twofold. One is relationships with people. And relationships with people primarily fulfill our basic non-physical human needs. Those are our emotional and social human needs. And that's community, uh, being recognized by our community, having a sense of purpose, um, you know, all of these things that are non-physical. And then there's, and so, and those relationships are cultivated through the gift. Gifting and sharing is the primary way that humans create, maintain, and deepen bonds with one another. So sharing is really the ultimate in my mind of how we create community, how we create bonds. The other half of, and, and that's like the T-Bus, the free T-Bus is the human non-physical need relationship-based element. Mr. Tinkerman, my other, my alter ego is all about the physical side of relationship-based economy, which is a relationship with the resources we use and consume. And so for millennia, tens, hundreds of thousands of years, humans have encyclopedic knowledge of all the plants, animals, minerals, etc., and all of the, the necessary um, wisdom and knowledge to survive and thrive in the natural world. And that knowledge was passed on for gen through generations. Um, we've kind of dis disconnected ourselves a lot in our modern society from having direct relationships with the things we use and consume. And of course, those help fulfill our basic physical needs, shelter, food, air, water. Um, and so those things, traveling with a free T bus was my way of cultivating an example of some of those things. Like I built my shelter, I, you know, therefore I don't have to pay money for rent. I harness my electricity from the sun. They don't, therefore I don't have an electric bill. I, most of my food comes through non-monetary interactions. Like, work trading, dumpster diving, wild harvesting, home sprouting and fermenting and canning and all of those things. And so, and then those, all of those, both those interlap, overlap the, the, the physical resource relationships and the human relationships. And oftentimes sharing a physical resource with someone is the way to build the non-physical bond. And oftentimes the non-physical bond is what provides you, you know, like, I can't tell you how many people were like, oh, you're, you know, you're creating the space for human connection. Let me invite you to my house for dinner or first, you know, so you can take a shower or whatever those things. It's like when we create this whole experience of having relationships with the people around us and with our resources, we start to reduce our dependency for, on money. And we also start to live in greater, have a greater sense of community, which is a basic human need. Um, and we can kind of live more holistic in, in the world, in a whole, whole, more holistic manner in the world. So relationship-based economy is really viewing relationships, both with people as well as the resources we use and consume as the highest form of value. So for your 
commoner or the normal person, normal person who works yeah. nine to five job, yeah. 40 hours a week type yeah. of life. How would you recommend they build more of this relationships econ based economy into their life? Yeah. And that's a great question. And uh, the most important thing is to remember uh, that it's always small steps. It's so easy to get caught up and be like, oh, I want to do this and do that. And I want to live this way. And I am just going to jump right into it. And I'm going to go all <laughs> out. And I love this, this idea in, uh, that permaculture uses a lot, which is this idea of transitional ethics. It's like, there's this place that we are and there's this place we want to get to. And there's a path to get there. And sometimes that path isn't straight. And sometimes you go a little forward, sometimes you go a little back and that's okay. As long as your trend is moving towards living the, getting to the place you want to go. And so in thinking about um, for a person working nine to five or doing the, the normal life thing, there's just, there's little steps that we can start taking. And what's fun is that I like seeing when people start taking these little steps, the magic that can start happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so some of those steps might just simply be making sure to invite people over for dinner or um, finding that thing that you're good at or have a passion for and share that with your friends and neighbors. Um, I love the, uh, the guy in Austin who did that hashtag food is free. He just said, I'm going to grow food in the, in the space between the, the sidewalk and the street, and it's free for all my neighbors. Um, it's very low cost or investment and great, great benefit for cultivating community in your neighborhood. So ultimately, finding ways to share and give to people, even if they're small, even if they're little, even if it's literally inviting a friend over for tea, which is for me, how it all started, or inviting strangers over for tea. Or on the other side, the relationship side, what are, if your goal is to spend less money, think about the things that you spend the most money on. And what are the ways that you could actually fulfill those things for yourself? Is it rent? Maybe you can find a work trade situation. Is it um, electricity? Maybe you can figure out um, how to, reduce how much you're using or put in a solar system or um, is it food maybe it's about finding a way how to do container gardening in your small apartment balcony um, and actually on that note if I can plug it Mason Hutchinson and Herb Rally are doing a um frugal nutrition course that will be coming out shortly. And I have nice. done a class for and with him on dumpster diving. So <laughs> that's one of my, <laughs> that's one of my contributions that it's a free course. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, check out Herb Rally. On that note, will you speak a little bit to dumpster diving? Yeah. Dumpster diving is a topic that people get a little squirmy about, but I'm super excited to talk about it because <laughs> it's really I am ecstatic about dumpster diving. I, it's really hard for me to walk by a dumpster and not look in it. Um, in nature, whenever there is quote unquote waste, there's actually no such thing as waste in nature, but anytime there's an excess of something, critters and creatures will come in and utilize that energy and um, that the material resource. Uh, and I am, I am that in modern society. Our society has enormous amounts of waste. And, and so I, I, I'm big on the building materials, but I'm also really big on um, dumpster diving for food. And most people think of a homeless guy eating a half eaten burger out of a trash can. And that's not what I'm talking about. Um, everyone has their boundaries with dumpster diving and it's just, you know, got to let people have their boundaries and do their thing. Um, for me, I'm a big fan of dumpster diving at grocery stores and primarily natural food stores. I, uh, it is technically kind of illegal. You could get charged with trespassing, but it's very rare. And there's all dumpster divers legal defense fund to help you out if you do get in trouble, as long as you're not doing anything stupid. Um, but basically we throw away 30 to 40% of our food in this country every day. And a lot of that is at gro in grocery stores. And so oftentimes you open a grocery store dumpster and it's half full of food. It's bruised fruit. It's um, 
prepackaged food that's expired. Um, and there's just, there's obviously lots of precautions to take, but um, there's plenty of amazing food out there in the dumpster. I mean, we could feed tens of millions of people, you know, probably a hundred million more people in this country if we were a little bit more frugal, uh, judicious with our, with our, um, our food. And, and on a side note, you know, we use the word economy to describe what our economic system is, but one of the definitions of um, economic is the judicious use of resources. And we don't do that very well with a lot of things in our country. And so a lot of the things like food waste are actually ineconomic. It's, they're, they're the opposite of economic. Um, but it's all built into the system on purpose. And when you shop at the grocery store, you are literally paying for food waste. And, and, and the reason behind that is because a, a business has to grow at three or 4% every year in our current economy due to inefficiencies and um, inflation and things like that. But the population of the United States only grows at 1% a year. So how do you as food manufacturers sell three to 4% more every year to a population that only grows 1% more? And that's creating foods that are addictive. So people eat more, that's taking the nutrition out of food. So people have to eat more and that's incorporating food waste into the system so that um, we have really stringent sell by dates, making it socially uh, unacceptable to eat a bruised fruit and everything has to be perfect. It's all designed to sell more, unfortunately. So that's where people like me come in yeah. <laughs> it's a, and it's just a band aid. Yeah, I remember my first time working on a farm. It was a peach farm. And after they had us harvesting like crazy right before rain came in, because they said, well, if the rain comes, it washes the fuzz off of the peaches. And if the fuzz gets washed off, we can't sell it. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I have a friend here who's a farm, an avocado farmer, and big wind comes by and blows hundreds of avocados down to the ground once they touch the ground they are no longer sellable wow so yeah. much ways yeah <laughs> <So crazy. laughs> yeah it's a yeah pretty wild culture that we live in yeah and that's and that's really you know one of the things i found is that there's lots of band-aids to the waste that happens you know my bus runs on recycled vegetable oil and that's one of the ways that um you know that's just a waste product from restaurant deep fryers and so they're and all, you know, the wood and in, in the bus is salvage or scrap. So we as individuals have great power in mitigating some of that, but there, a lot of it, that's just kind of a band-aid and that larger structural and systemic changes need to occur in order for that not to be there in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. The larger structural questions are, is probably something beyond the scope of this conversation. Yeah, here. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> definitely one. something, yeah. something to keep in mind around um, how can we, the, that note of transitional uh, ethics that you brought up before with how can we take a step-by-step -step approach, perhaps it's through your dumpster diving, or I love the simplicity of inviting people over for dinner or just for tea, like so easy to boil yeah. water and add a plant totally. in and off you go. Wonderful conversations. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. in all of those little steps add up, you know, until at some point you look at your life and you say, whoa, I am like, so, so much more deeply living my values or experiencing um, relationships in a way that I, I wasn't experiencing them before, you know? Yeah. Well, taking it back to the free tea party, do you have recommendations for how people can take that model and utilize, create their own free tea party in their home? and in their community. That's part one of the question. Yeah. Part two of the question is, I heard whispers about you writing a book about this subject. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> I, so I am writing a book, but it is more the technical side and it's all the running a vehicle and waste vegetable oil and solar power and using salvage materials. And so that is almost out. That'll be out before the end of the year and that's it'll be free to download. Wow. Um, it's all hand-drawn using tea ink. What? So, wow. which is like over steep tea and like rusty nails soaked in vinegar and then mix it together and it makes like a jet black ink, um, mm -hmm. which kind of dries brown. So the whole thing is there's over 150 hand drawings wow. um, and it's all the systems and using Edna Lou, the free tea bus as an example for 
cultivating the systems on the for the the relation the kind of resource relationship side of relationship based economy. I will get to someday writing a book about the social side of that of the free T bus, but for the time being, what I can say is there's this great quote from Senno Rikyu, who is the father of the Japanese tea ceremony, or some people consider him the father of the Japanese tea ceremony. He said, tea is not but this. First you boil the water, then you make the tea, and then you drink it. And that's coming from you know, a culture and tradition where the utter complexity of the tea part ceremony is a lot of people are turned off by that. I was initially at first, but coming to realize that the reason for that complexity is really to help us focus and realize on that paradox or that Zen idea that something as simple as making a cup of tea is utterly complex. And something, and just as it's complex, it's also very simple. And so I just, I mean, I really just encourage people, tea is, it's something that's hard to mess up, especially if you're making herbal tea, you know, you're not going to oversteep your herbal tea probably. And, um, and I just say, do it just, it, it can be as simple as a little teapot and a couple people and one just mint picked, you know, mint grows crazy, just picking mint in the garden and steeping it in the teapot. Um, and that's, that's one of the cool things I learned on my journey is that there are so many plants that grow all over the place that you can make in a tea. Uh, literally, I can pull my bus up and there's a 50% chance that within a hundred feet somewhere, as long as there's green things growing, that there's something that can be brewed into tea. Um, so it doesn't even have to cost you money necessarily. You know, it's just the, maybe a little bit of energy to, to heat the water. Um, and then, I don't know, invite people just see who shows up. Uh, you know, maybe you put a, maybe it's just in your neighborhood. You put a little free tea sign out on your porch or uh, you just call your friends and invite them over or you do a weekly thing where you're, you know, if you put it out on, you know, some public forum like Facebook or Craigslist or something. And, and some, sometimes I would do that. I would roll into town and I would go to the free section on Craigslist and make a post that says free tea and tell people where I was going to be parked. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I remember I was super inspired by your project back when I first met you. And when I created my herbal course in Connecticut, that was one of the inspirations for why that class that you showed up at happened. Yay. <laughs> yeah, because I had all these weekly themes. And then at the end of the course, after all these weeks together, we wrap it up with a free tea party where we invite our community and whoever wants to join my class to come in and join us for a cup of tea, yeah. a couple cups of tea. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, and it's so cool because I've seen that a lot as I've traveled people who have taken something from the free tea bus and morphed it into what fits for them and for their community. Um, there was a couple in Georgia um, who I just met randomly. I was looking for vegetable oil at a restaurant and they were eating, dining there. And they were like, what your vehicle runs on vegetable oil. And I, <laughs> had a great conversation with them and they took me out to lunch and they started these share boxes around their neighborhood and they got all their friends to put on their fences. Like they're kind of like little free libraries or little free pantries, but they're just, it's clothes. It's kitchenware. It's like just anything that people have access of. And then they have a Facebook group. And so people will be like, Hey, I just put a bunch of size 32 pants in the box at such and such street or, and so there's, there's all of these things, you know, a lot of people, look at the free tea bus and like, oh, I want to do that, you know, start driving on free tea or whatever. And I, my, I always like to impress upon people, like take what the things that you're passionate about, that you have skills in or passion for, or have the resources for, and tie that together to create your gift that you have to share. Like for me, my passion is travel. My passion is like building and fixing things and auto mechanics and you know tea was actually not really a passion of mine it just kind of fell in my lap um but it was for me it was taking these things that i have passion and resources and skills around and figuring out a way to tie it all together in order to create the container for my gift um and so i encourage people yes definitely have free tea parties if that's inspiring to you heck yes um but also just you know think about what, what it is that you, what are the resources you have? What are the skills you have? And, and those things are 
not always, but oftentimes can be the, the place that you have the most success. Mm. So asking ourselves the question of what are my existing gifts and resources, then how can I express this further and share this yes. with my people? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I love that. Giuseppe, as we enter the quiet contemplative season of winter, besides looking forward to your tea drawn book coming out, do you have other favorite books or resources that you'd like to share with folks? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, along the lines of what we've been talking about, um, some of my favorite books, um, one is called The Gift by Lewis Hyde. And he writes extensively about the gift in traditional societies and in the folklore of um, a lot of cultures around the world and, and how a lot of the stories um, from traditional societies revolve around the gift and kind of the message around the gift and, and how that you know, relates to building relationships and community. Um, and kind of how our modern society of highly calculated exchange creates the opposite, creates boundaries, which is okay. It's okay to have boundaries, um, but we just can't forget to, to, to create bonds as well. So mm -hmm. The Gift by Lewis Hyde. Um, and then one of my favorites is also called Debt, The First 5,000 Years by uh, David Graeber, who I think is an anthropologist slash economist, maybe more of an anthropologist, but he writes about um, the myth of barter and this idea that we, we've we always like, that we had before money that was barter. Um, and and that's, it's a little, you know, it's, it's a little heavy reading, but it's great to kind of get a little bit more expansive idea about um, maybe tr traditional human societies and, and debt and barter and money and all the things that kind of make up our modern society, which I really love the question. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to think what, uh, pick a fun one, a fun <laughs> one. What, no, if read fun reading, um, <laughs> well, pick up the T-Bus factory service manual when it comes yes. out, that's my book. <laughs> and, uh, whew, I'm like this weird person. I, I read primarily non-fiction like I read like technical service manuals before I go to bed so <laughs> I, that's fun for me but for most people that's not very fun um you got me stumped that's the hardest question you asked me doing yeah well different types of fun how about poetry oh poetry well um Service manuals. Service manuals, yeah. That's a poetry to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick up, maybe pick up The Book of Tea by oh. Okakura Kakuzo. Oh, yeah. That's a great book on Japanese tea um, mm -hmm. that is very poetic in nature. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Any final words or thoughts to share with us before we sign off for today? Well, I just really enjoyed sitting here talking to you, Jiling. I remember the first time we met, when you told me your name, you said something like, like Darjeeling, but I don't know exactly what, without Dar or something. So yeah. I am drinking a cup of Darjeeling for you right now. Ah, that's so sweet. That actually came from Seven Song when we were figuring out how to introduce me to people because it's always so challenging. Like Jiling, it sounds exactly like it's spelled, but people rarely get it right here in the yeah. US. Yeah. So Seven Song came up with that. Like <laughs> you're Dar Jiling minus the Dar. Jiling. Yeah. Yep. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I do, I just, I really appreciate the taking the time to chat with me. And uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm so excited. Um, and I, I'd love to hear anyone who has any questions, don't hesitate to email me, um, free tea party at Gmail. And I, I don't know, I hope, I hope to, to share tea with you again sometime, Jiling, and with anyone out there listening. Um, yeah, I hope to create that space once again in this world um, post-pandemic to, to share some free tea. Same here. So folks can find you on free 
teaparty.org. Yes. And also on Facebook and Instagram, right? Yep. And it's all free tea party. So free tea party all over. Giuseppe, thank you so much for sharing with us. And it's been such a pleasure and such an honor to speak with you today. And for everyone, thank you so much for listening to Tea Talks with Jiling on Herbal Radio. If you would like to reach out, then you can email Giuseppe at freeteaparty at gmail.com. And you can also email me with any questions or comments at lingjiling at gmail.com or find me on my website at jilinglin.com. Until next time. Time. Happy herbal adventures. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>